hasn't registered yet. Um, it is a um, job search meta engine in a way. Uh, you can see all the NHS jobs advertised across whole UK, whether that job is in track jobs, NHS jobs, Scotland jobs, or Northern Ireland, doesn't matter. Um, you can search for all of them uh, in our platform, uh, use excellent filters, receive daily notifications. Only thing you need to do is just select junior doctor and medical, junior doctor and um, medical doctor in profession and grade, and you will receive notifications. Other than that, you can do a couple of other things that we will mention in the webinar as well. You can generate your personal segment with AI. Um, you can download your CV. And we are doing these webinars to just help the community um, in the best pos possible way we can. And the, the last webinar was about NHS job applications that you can watch the recording um, that I'll, I'll share in the chat. And then after this one, we will do another one about clinical attachment. So if you can register an account in the platform, you will be able to receive the email. Um, so today we have two excellent speakers that I'm really glad uh, that they are here. Um, uh, Dr. Klitsch is a radiology registrar um, in London. He has finished internal medicine um, training and then decided to start radiology and he's been a such a helpful person for IMGs in the last couple of years um doing different hundred different roles and he will talk about a bit more and uh, Ajener our second speaker is a orthopedic registrar in London and she's just um an excellent person uh, with an immense wealth of knowledge and she's quite enthusiastic about sharing her experiences about surgical um, scenarios with all of you. Um, so yeah, let's 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 start. Um, Jakob, would you like to take the microphone and start your presentation? Hi, can everyone hear me? Yep, yep, we can. Perfect. Uh, I just need to be able to share my screen if that's OK. It's not allowing me to share. Uh, yeah, can you try again now? And if you, if... Yes, now I can do that. Give me one second. Um, can everyone see the presentation? Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me as well? Yes, yes, it's okay, loud perfect. Here. So ju just first of all, apologies. I'm at work at the moment. Actually, I'm on call. So if I do get any phone calls, I would have to pause for a few seconds if that's OK. And I apologise in advance for that. So today we'll be talking about the NHS interview uh, and how to prepare for it in a nutshell. So who am I? I'm, my name's Jakob. I'm a radiology registrar. Thank you so much, uh, Ali, for uh, that beautiful introduction. I work at UCLH at the moment, uh, but I'm doing a paediatric uh, block at GOSH. I'm also the um, previous education officer and that current national lead for the Society of Radiologists in Training. I just want to thank Job Clark for giving this opportunity for this webinar. Uh, hopefully it will benefit everyone. As Ali mentioned, Job Clark is an excellent website where it uses multiple different uh, AI tools to enhance your application and really get that idle job that you uh, uh, endeavour. 
So what will we cover today? So we'll talk a bit about the pre-interview preparation and then we'll go on to about uh, the NHS non-training interview. And I've said non-training. Um, it is different, but similar to training interviews, which we'll touch up on and how to tackle common questions. Uh, and then the team will also give uh, a mock interview. Um, we'll ask one of the audience members to, to, to volunteer for that, if that's OK. So first part of um, you know any NHS interview or any interview for that matter is the first impression. I cannot emphasize how important the first impression is. And according to research, believe it or not, um, uh, interviews decide if you are the candidate in the, in the first few minutes. And that's and, that, and that's done by you know how well you come across. So things like dressing appropriately, looking the part is key. So it's so important to dress the part. In the UK, I know that there's a lot of people from different areas uh, around the world on this call today, webinar today. So in the UK, it's very important to dress appropriately. Uh, for, for men wear suits and uh, uh, or, you know smart casual wear, smart wear, and same uh, with females with dress. It's all important to get a good night's sleep beforehand. Don't come to the interview looking tired. Um, it doesn't give off a good impression. Uh, since COVID-19, most interviews have now, unfortunately, gone into remote interviews. So it's also important to think about the home setup. You know, having good lighting in the background, having the camera to a level where you, you know, you can the the, the interviewer can actually see you and to eye level. Apparently, that according to research makes a big difference as well. I know these are small details, but I think it, uh, in the end it makes a big difference. One thing I'd say is it's so important to look at the person's specification of any job you're applying to. Believe it or not, most of the questions come up or a device from the person's specification. So things like communication, teamwork, leadership, property, uh, you know, resilience and so on. As you can see from this example, um, the interviews make questions from from this. So it's so important to study. And I can give you a real life example in the radiology interview, as I'm a radiologist um, in training, um, they base every year for training interviews, they base it upon upon uh, the essential person specification. This changes year on year. So it's important to have a peek at that. Uh, I can't emphasize enough how important this book is. Um, study it like the Bible. It gives you, uh, we're going to go through some of the things mentioned in this book, but it's, it's such a good study tool or guide to use when in preparing for your interview, and I highly recommend it. So before actually going to the interview, um, it's so important to find a bit about the actual hospital you're going to, you've applied for, you know, doing a bit of research about the hospital, what they're well known for, learning a bit about the department research um, and showcasing that at the interview, because that will really set aside someone who's just rocked up to the interview compared to someone who's really prepared for the interview, is enthusiastic, knows what's happening in the department and has an idea of what's happening in the department, their research output or what, you know, the hospital's well known for. So I would highly recommend you do that and showcase that in your, uh, in your interview itself. Aside from that, it's also a good idea to look at the CQC ratings, as it may um, you know, help you decide if you if you do get an interview uh, an offer after an interview if you want that hospital or not. So it's always good to have a look at the hospital and do a bit of Google research. It goes a long way. So I mentioned about non-training and training interviews. So they're fairly similar, uh, and essentially. The non-training interview is split up into three different stations. Most of the time, uh, there'll be a panel uh, of two consultants uh, and maybe a HR person. And similarly, in, in, in a training interview, will be that way as well. But instead of a HR person, you have someone from the from member of public just to make sure the interview is is fair. But that's not always the case. So you at least always have two people, two consultants interviewing you. Okay. Uh, and there's three common stations. The first one's the portfolio station. So that's all about your CV and about yourself. Then the second question is usually about clinical scenarios. Um, and then that obviously changes depending on the speciality. And then the first one, which is a killer, is the ethical uh, station. And in the UK, they put a lot of emphasis on that. And that helps them to differentiate good candidates from excellent candidates, which we'll discuss now. Okay, so portfolio station, guys. I can't 
you know, emphasize enough how important, how crucial the station is. It's literally, you know, easy to get brownie points on this station. You need to sell yourself like there's no tomorrow. Really showcase your CV um, to, to, to your interviews. Don't shy away. A lot of people go to interview and really hide all their achievements. It's the time to really shine and bring out all your achievements. And there's two techniques that we use uh, for for uh, for the portfolio station, which I'll come on to. But really, really do showcase your attributes in the portfolio station, and they just want to know a bit about you, your CV, and your background. So, what do you, the interviewers actually look for, and how do they differentiate uh, people? You know, the the person they should give a job or the or not. So essentially, ideally, they look for the candidate who demonstrates the most enthusiasm for the speciality or for the job. And how how is this done? How is this evaluated? They look at things like, has this candidate done a placement on Taster Week? Have they been involved in any sort of research or audit or QIP project, which stands for Quality Improvement Project, especially related to the speciality? You know, do you understand what it takes to work at that hospital? Or have you done some background research into it? And you know, any way that you can demonstrate your teamwork and communication and leadership skills. These are the key aspects or tenets that they look for uh, when choosing a candidate. And it's so important to, pre to prepare according to this. Coming back to the portfolio station, as I mentioned, there's two ways to answer that uh, the, the question in the portfolio station. And there's two structures to, to use. In the UK, they love using structures when, when answering questions and they look for this. And it really does separate someone who's prepared, who knows what they're talking about, and someone who's just fluking the interview, if that makes sense. So for the portfolio question, uh, for questions like, why do you want this job? Tell me about you, take us through your CV, or tell me about yourself and so on. You use the CAMP technique, to, guys, and that stands for Clinical Academic Management and Personal. Each each uh, section should include two to three set centers each, okay? So, and you should be able to you know, answer the question in, in around three minutes. And obviously don't go on for longer or you'll or else you'll bore, uh, bore the interviewer. And the thing to really emphasize on is whatever, as you're preparing for each section when answering the question, you have to give a good example, back up your example uh, with a skill that you want to portray, like team working or, member, or leadership skills, and then, and then, emphasize why you're the best candidate. So for example, if if, if the question is why you want this job, you use the CAMP technique, you, you mentioned four different parts. So clinical, you talk about your past experience, give an example of you know uh, your clinical experience or rotations that you've been involved in, uh, give an example of, I don't know, something like how you dealt with stressful situation, related, relate that to the actual question, uh, and you know that, and then to the speciality, and they'll give you the extra edge. Similarly, academic part, mention all all your previous publications, audits, QIPs, and so on. Again, give an example. Try to use a, a skill set that you've improved on, such as membership, so 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 such as leadership or team working. Relate that back to the question. Same thing for management as well. So any any sort of society you've been involved in, any leadership role, or management you've role you've you've held, showcase that in this answer. And lastly, personal part, a line or two, just about a brief about yourself, your hobbies, just so the uh, interview knows you're a well-rounded candidate and you're not going to sort of burn on the stress. So that's the camp technique. For questions which are more of giving specific examples, you use the STAR technique. So for, for questions like, you know, how do you deal with stress or give us an example of an audit, you separate the answer into four, four sections again. So you describe the challenge you're facing, depending on the, the question, obviously. Describe your role or duty in that scenario. And then how you completed, how you overcame that scenario or the problem. And in this, when you're explaining that, make sure to mention a skill set. Again, communication, team working, whatever it is that's expected in the personal specification. Give a good example um, of that. And then the result, how you overcame the problem and what separates the best candidates, how you've reflected and how you've become a better doctor and why you're suited, why you're the best candidate for this job. OK, so that's the STAR technique uh, in a nutshell. So giving a situ you know, situation, task, action and result. And examples of when you can use CAMP and STAR. 
So camp questions more, you know, if you get questions, as I mentioned, take us through your CV. Why do you want to do X specialty? Tell me about yourself. Tell us about why you want to join the trust. Again, it's ex essentially all the same question. You use the, the camp technique to talk about your clinical background, your academic background, give examples, your management and your personal uh, background. And again, give sk skills, uh, attributes about yourself, give examples related to the job. Yeah, and emphasize why you're the best candidate. Similarly, with the STAR technique, you know, question examples are, you know, have you ever led an audit? Tell me about an interesting audit or how do you cope with stress? Again, think about a, a stressful t a time where you've been under stress. Have you dealt with that stress using the STAR technique? And when you're answering the question, again, emphasize from the person's specification the key attributes that they want to see so that you can be the best candidate amongst the others being interviewed. So that's uh, briefly the portfolio station and how to really ace the portfolio station guys again remember be structured in your in in answers the worst thing uh, a candidate can do is try answering a, one of these questions ramble on not have a real structure and by that time the interviewer is going to be really bored so make sure of a structure i would advise using the camp and star technique clinical station is the next station i'm not going to um, emphasize a lot uh, or go on a lot about the station. This station really differs depending on the type of um, specialty you're applying for. So, for example, cardiology will be a cardiac related clinical question, AE would be an AE related one. But the answers are very similar. They again want to see a structure. And in the UK, what's grilled into medical students or doctors in the UK is the ABCDE technique. So whatever question you have or clinical scenario you have, use the ABCDE technique. Now, I won't go through this in detail. Um, you can use the, the Clinical Oxford book. Uh, at, the, at the end, it has some clinical uh, emergency section where it goes through the ABCDE technique. And also this booklet, that if you Google this ATSP, uh, the ultimate guide to being a confident FY1 out of hours, again, it goes through the ABCDE technique. Um, and that's in itself is a whole different seminar. So if you read, uh, use the ABCDE technique in this, in the clinical situation uh, station, um, you'll do really well. And the key thing here, though, is to always be safe, especially if you're applying for a junior level, always be safe and escalate to your seniors. And that's the essential thing that they want to see when you're answering this question. It is a bit about, you know, obviously your knowledge of the speciality, but mainly about, you know, is this candidate safe? Can they escalate? Can I trust this candidate? Can they work with me? OK, so again, you read the Oxford Clinical Handbook and then this one that you that I've um, put up here. You can take a picture. Feel free to take a picture of that. Now, the killer station, the ethical station, this station is key because it's really separates the candidate, uh, f you know, the, the quality top candidate from from the rest. And a technique that I uh, like to use and, you know, there are different forms of, of, of techniques when you're answering the ethical stations, but the I spice technique I, I found I found really useful. So what is the I spice technique? So it's separated to issues, seek information, patient safety, initiative, escalate and support. Now, depending, obviously this all depends on the type of ethical question you get, okay? But the first thing is issues, obviously. What are the main issues being presented in the scenario? A good candidate will really summarize at the beginning the main issue of the question. OK. Secondly, sick information. How do you how do I gather more information to confirm what's happening? So don't immediately, depending again on the context, don't immediately jump to conclusions from what you've been told. Seek information, clarify what's going on. OK, patient safety is so, so, so important to read the GMP, the Good Medical Practice Handbook from the GMC on patient safety. And what it says there and highlights is, you know, making patients your first concern. And that's what you have to explain here and that's what you have to emphasize here you know you have to ensure when you're answering this question you're using this technique that patient safety is paramount then initiative talk about how you would overcome the the issue at hand the ethical scenario at hand the the the, the method that you use to overcome the the easiest or the, the method that, that you use to overcome uh, the problem at hand as quick as possible and as safe, safe as possible and then escalate. Escalation, again, is key, especially if you're a junior level, how you would escalate for help and at what stage. And then support. The last S is, again, really crucial. Again, we'll separate the, you know, candidates, the A star from the A candidate is, you know, how have you offered support? 
uh, to patients, to staff, to even the perpetrator or or who, depending on the context, whoever it is. OK, and if you've seen if this is a one off event or is this a recurring event? So let's dive in a bit deeper. So issues, uh, again, you know, start your answer with a brief statement of the main issue. This will really show the interview that you are, that, you know, you're not rushing the question, you're understanding the question if you're summarizing it at the beginning and you have situation of awareness. And it will quickly, you know, it tick, ticks boxes in their mind. So it's crucial to do that. And it just has to be one statement, a clear statement of the issue at hand. And then seeking information, as I mentioned, you're not jumping the, to conclusions. You're going to seek uh, information on what's happened. For example, if a colleague's been accused, um, accusing a colleague of, of misconduct could be disastrous, obviously, for their working relationship. For this step, what you can do is you can gather information by asking the individual involved to explain further. OK, rather than jumping to conclusion. And I'm going to give you an example after I go through this. Again, patient safety, good medical practice. Make sure you read that and you may maintain patient safety as your priority. Initiative, the quickest way you, where you can overcome the problem by using initiative or uh, doing something that can really resolve the issue at hand. OK. And then escalation. Escalation comes in two parts. The first part is how you'd escalate help to get help to resolve the situation. And then second part, which again will make you into the better candidate or the top candidate, taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture, how you could prevent this from happening again. You know, seeing if this is an isolated incident or a recurring incident. Now in the UK, they, they love the you know chain of escalations. And there's two different chains that you should use when answering this question, guys. If it's a clinical scenario, you should use this, okay? So if you're if you're a junior member of staff, the first person you escalate to is to senior trainee. And then if there's no senior trainee to, to a supervising consultant, if there's no supervising consultant to a clinical lead, division director, medical director, or last option, chief executive officer. This is the chain of escalation for any given clinical ethical problem, okay? However, if you've been asked a question on an educational issue, an ethical issue in terms of education or academia, you escalate to your ES first, your education supervisor, then to your training program director or college tutor, and then to your postgraduate dean. This is obviously more for training interview, but you'll have similar roles in the, in the, in the non-training setting as well. And as I mentioned, the candidate who can see the take a step back and uh, you know look at the bigger picture is the candidate who will do much much well compared to other candidates and that just means you know if you're able to reflect on the question use your skills uh, and identify if this is a recurring problem or, or an isolated problem and if it's a recurring problem you can say things like you know i'll do an audit or call to improve project to which may be helpful to to resolve to prevent any issues like this happening again in the future and if we were to give a quick example that I've a question that I've made and my own answer. So the question is, a patient tells you that one of the radiology consultants had shouted verbal abuse at them during their ultrasound scan and they are clearly upset. You know the consultant is not usually like that. What do you do? So this is actually a question that's asked. Um, it can be asked, sorry. Um, uh, and it's realistic and it can happen. So again, using the ice spice taking issue, what I, what I would say. So nobody should suffer abuse of any form. However, the issue in this situation is that a patient has been upset by a consultant. Although this differs from my own experience with the consultant, making an accusation without understanding the situation would be inappropriate. Clear, it's very clear, succinct to the point. I've summarised the issue. Yeah, not much to, more to be said. Next step, seeking information. How I would answer it. So the first step would be to speak to the patient away from the consultant and ask them to clarify what had happened. After all, what the patient calls verbal abuse may be an expression of anger, not necessarily directed at them. Again, I'm not jumping to conclusions. I'm getting, you know, seeking information from both sides to clarify the issue at hand. Next, I'll mention patient safety. So next, I would re reassure the patient that I'll take their concern very se seriously. If any verbal abuse has indeed happened, then it would erode the public's trust in the medical profession, possibly impacting patient diagnostics and treatment. Then I would use my initiative. I would then speak directly to the consultant question in a non-accusatory manner. This is so important, guys. In a non-accusatory manner to let them know that one of the patients seemed quite upset after the ultrasound scan and to ask if there were any difficulties in scanning. If there was a HCA or a nurse in the room, 
I will ask them for their opinion or of a witness account of what's happened. Although I'm not trying to investigate the accusation myself as I'm very junior, this would allow me to judge whether I thought that this was a real case of verbal abuse directed at the patient, which would be unacceptable, and what to tell my clinical supervisor when asking for help. Then I'll escalate, guys. So the issue is sensitive, especially as a false accusation about the consultant, as it will damage their reputation, as well as my working and educational relationship with them. Therefore, I'll speak to my clinical supervisor to ask what they would advise all while keeping the consultant's identity anonymous. If my supervisor is a consultant in question, then the clinical lead for radio should be the next person to contact. Okay, so I've appropriately escalated here, guys, as per the uh, flow diagram that I showed you. And then the last part, support, I would ensure to apologize to the patient that they have been distressed by the matter and explain that this will be fully investigated. I would also provide the details to the PALS office so they can complain if they wanted to. So this is how I would approach it now, what I would say, guys, uh, when answering this question with an example. I hope that makes sense. Now, when preparing for the um, for this section, um, there are a few common topics or themes that come up. And, you know, it's not your fault, but obviously most of these you won't know about if you haven't done a clinical attachment. I would highly advise you to do a UK clinical attachment to learn more about this. But read up on things like, do not attempt resuscitation forms, mental health facts, section 23136 when it's used, the deprivation of liberty. And again, if you're on call when you would use that in a patient. Capacity assessment is a very common question that comes up. Things like how would you, consultant can ask you, how would you assess capacity and breaking bad news. And this is not an exhaustive list. There's much more uh, common scenarios, but this is a few that I've picked out. So my final last few words, how would I? What would I advise you to do to maximise your points? Always show that when you answer that you're you're a very safe but serious candidate. As at the end of the day, you're, the consultant's going to be working with you, and they want to know that you're 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 a safe person. It goes a long way, you know, being polite. And again, consultants want to see, see this and be prepared, guys. Be really prepared, um, as you know. They want someone who's well organized and knows what not knows what they're talking about. Um, and for any potential question, I would actually prepare an answer for and memorize the answer, but at the same time, not sound sort of robotic and you know, practice multiple times, practice, practice, practice to sound very fluent. I hope that helps, guys. And that's just NHS interview in a nutshell. Feel free to ask any questions. Thank you, Jakub. Uh, yeah, I was I was trying to answer a couple of questions in the chat, uh, but yeah, um, we we are on time, and please feel free to um, send your questions through, and then we can continue with our next speaker. Um, I think we can give five to ten minutes for questions here. Um, I'm just gonna give people a minute to think about. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, all these messages, and we are gonna Happy continue. To Happy yeah. to answer any question, guys. Feel free. Um, I'll just raffle on a bit more. So, oh, someone's actually asked, asked what to do if I what to do if I was were asked a question that I have no idea about. I mean, they do also so look at things like how you would, um, how you would behave or act in a scenario where you're clueless. And I think it's a good, actually a good opportunity, depending on what the context is or whatever the question is, even if it's not the correct answer, try and showcase your attributes or your skills, especially team working, communication, leadership skills. Try, depending on the context, obviously, try and give an example of this. Uh, give an example, emphasize the skill, and explain why, how you reflected on it. it's made you a best, better, better doctor, and then say why it's, why you're the best candidate for the role, depending on the skill set that you've explained. That would be my advice. But my top advice would also be, you know, prepare for every possible question that'll come up. So make model answers for each question that'll come up. Okay, I'll, I'll if, if, if it's okay, I'll go through the questions. For yeah, you, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So we will be, well, we will follow the order. Um, sure. Well, can you give an example of what was your biggest mistake? I mean, maybe we, if what what kind of structure you would follow so people can think about. Yeah. Ideas. So I would use the star technique here, and you know, 
in the in the UK, what they want, to, obviously, don't go in and say massive mistakes that you've done. It doesn't look nice. But think about small mistakes that you've done, where uh, you know, um, small mistakes that you've done where you've reflected upon it, uh, and you, there hasn't been major patient harm, but it's improved services. For example, I'm just giving a random example. Okay. Uh, one mistake mistake could be you're a junior clinical fellow on a ward you're trying to take blood tests okay um and you and you've put in a cannula in but that cannula hasn't been changed for more than a week and then you know patients had sepsis afterwards or whatever i'm just giving you a random example okay you can say that was your mistake you didn't check when the cannula was put in but what you would do was you know you would do a quality improvement object project or audit looking at the rate of change of cannulas in the department and then think of an intervention how to prevent that from happening something simple like that okay but again it can be anything the key thing is showing how you've improved as a doctor and then you know saying things like keywords like audit court improvement projects really goes a long way I can see some questions like how to break a bad news to a patient. Guys, that's a very, very long-winded answer. I, I don't think it's appropriate uh, for the seminar at the moment. Um, as in itself, it, you, I would need to do justice to really answer that question. And in itself, is a you know, 15, 20-minute topic to, to discuss. Maybe we could do another webinar on that or, or, or a course on that. Um, but essentially, in a nutshell, to answer that question, um, the way you break bad news is you you be as supportive as possible you never break bad news on yourself you always make sure there's a senior with you a nurse with you uh, and uh, before breaking bad news you obviously ask how much the patient wants to know if they actually want to know what, what the test results or whatever whatever it is you know then bre actually breaking the bad news telling them what's gone wrong but the key thing is making sure that there's avenues for support for the patient throughout and again i know it's a very short answer but it's uh, it's in itself another webinar oh we can't hear you ali sorry i'll follow through the questions um and but before doing that and i can see a hand dr arson well i'll give you i'll give you a chance to speak in a second um what i can do is quickly what i'm just gonna do is um very briefly show you the platform as well because lots of questions are actually quite can be answered with this quite presentation, a uh, small presentation. So what we do, we do a couple of things. We help you to um, get an interview in, in in a way that you can apply to jobs as quickly as possible. And we, we do that by getting all the jobs together in one platform. So you, only thing you need to do is basically select medical doctor and junior in the filters. And as you can see, some jobs are from NHS jobs, some jobs from health jobs UK or Scotland jobs or Northern Ireland. And what you can do is actually you can get your personal statement generated with AI, you can get your uh, application form filled with our co-pilot. And, and the, maybe the main thing about this, uh, this webinar is we have excellent CPD accredited courses and a couple of them are actually quite related to uh, this webinar. The first, first one is the communication and interpersonal skills and its the second one is ethics so we go through nearly 20 30 different scenarios and answer them in the framework that we have mentioned and it's all video courses uh, which you can watch it's, it's kind of a Coursera type courses and we really we really believe these courses are the top in the market right now and yeah i'll i'll, I'll continue with the questions um, Dr. Sumbal, I'm just going to give you a, a, a chance to speak. You can you can unmute yourself, um, but if you are not here, or if you hello, could, yep, yep, we can hear you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Ali. It is a really nice platform, and uh, uh, I heard very good things. Um, actually, nowadays I'm in um, applying for different jobs. I applied yep. for two to three jobs. So I want to ask that, as you said, that uh, you should uh, like tell them that how you are going to fit good into the job. So for this purpose, we need to change CV every time. What we should be done for the junior clinical fellow? So I want to know specifically because it was a hurdle, like what to write and what to do because uh, you are applying yeah. as a junior clinical fellow. And yeah, I'll ask that. I'll answer that question, Ali, if, you, if, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. So the thing is, guys, so 
I can imagine you're, you're applying for se several jobs in one go and you're sending one CV. Now, yeah. it, it, the candidate who will be picked, unfortunately, is the candidate who where the CV is very much aligned to the person specification. So unfortunately, you do have to change your application form or your CV to suit that type of application and emphasizing the points that's mainly asked in the personal specification. Obviously, a lot of the jobs do overlap, but there mm -hmm. has to be a specific theme to it. So I per, my personal advice would be to do you should change it according to the specific application. Mm -hmm. OK, I know it and takes a lot of time. I know it takes a lot yeah. of time, but yeah. it has to be done because in the current climate, unfortunately, there's jobs like each each job. There's 400, 500, 600 applicants and these yeah. HR people, unfortunately, they just sort of go through multiple uh, CVs all in one go. Mm -hmm. If they, mm -hmm. they, they their, their eyes are attracted to the to the CV where it's most aligned with what mm -hmm. they're looking for. So that's why mm -hmm. I would advise you to change it according to the job. OK, and one more thing is like there is uh, you can like uh, put your online CV, you can make an online CV or you can fill the application or you can upload the CV. What you suggest? What's a good idea to do that? That's entirely up to you, whatever you feel more comfortable. I don't think it makes a big difference. If you feel okay. you're put, you can put yourself with uploading your CV, feel free to do that. Um, that's that's a very personal, personal thing, to be honest. It, I, to answer your question, it doesn't really matter. It depends on, on you, to be honest. But from an employer point of view, it doesn't matter really. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to go through questions, but uh, just a quick reminder, we will not be able to take to further questions due to time. So I'm just going to be just going to try to clear the current questions submitted. Um, but there will be another round of questions at the end. Um, so yeah, um, could you please discuss how to approach ER scenarios in a glance? Um, so we will do the clinical scenarios in a bit. And although it's not going to be ER specific, uh, it's going to be all about how to answer a clinical scenario. So sorry about that, Sarah. We will not go into the ER scenarios right now. Um, so the breaking bad news, yeah, I already answered. Um, can you show us again the initial slides? The, we we are recording the session and we will share the recording link uh, tomorrow via email. Um, thanks for that. Um, what are your weakest points? I think this this question can be answered in the same way that Jakub answered the question about what was your biggest mistake. Uh, don't make a very like big point. Don't make it a very big, big, quite a weak, weakest point. And just try to say like how you will, how you are trying to overcome this. And yeah, the same again, weakness question. What management include for senior clinical fellow radiologists? Um, I mean, yeah, if you want to answer this, but I, I think the I thing, the question. Come to, yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the, I don't understand the question. Okay, so it says what management I think can be included for senior senior clinical fellow of radiologist posts. That's my understanding. Uh, maybe oh, things be, like yeah, rotor coordinators and things like it, that. It could be anything, anything undergraduate you've done. It doesn't have to be radiology related, as you said. It could be rotor coordinator. Um, it could be if you've been the clinical lead of the department. It could even be things like you've done a project and you was the leader of the project, or if you've done teaching and you've led teaching and you've management, you've managed. Uh, people to come on to talk on your teaching program, anything management related. If you have anything national as well, for example, in the UK, uh, if you've had like a representative role in the BMA and so on, or in your respective countries, again, equally anything to be honest. There's no, there's nothing specific, and it doesn't have to be 100% radiology related. Thank you. Um, again, for all job application related questions, guys, I shared our last webinar a couple of times and unfortunately this is all about interviews so it will be not fair to attendees it will not fair to anyone to go through applications questions um so yeah um i'm just gonna skip a couple of application questions i'm really sorry about that um that's going through the cv should be less than two and when you practice at home it should be uh, most one point like one and a half minutes. Um, yeah, you can put the the, the 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 question is, can we have this courses for our CV? Yes, we the courses are CPT accredited. We are providing certificate and you can put into your CV and it is the cheapest um, in the market that as you can um, see for yourself. Um, 
couple of other uh, Java applications questions, guys. Again, um, I shared the YouTube link. I'm I'm gonna share it again. Um, the last question, just to like close. Uh, although it's about uh, Java application, you can change your experience. Um, you just you just need to make your experience related to that job. And yeah, the communication and teamwork questions are part of non-training role for job interviews, hundred percent. So you need to study for that. And yes, let's 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 carry on with the um, second speaker and all the answered questions. I'm going to answer in the chat, so don't worry about it if your question hasn't answered. So because this is not about job applications, but I'm going to do my best to answer all job application questions as well. Um, so yeah, that's our second speaker, um, right, um, Ajener. So yeah, Ajener, would you, if, if you'd like to unmute yourself and take the screen, thanks. Hello, can you hear me, Ali? Yes, loud and clear, thanks. And I can see you as well. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Jakub, I think it was great. And I feel like, oh, I didn't prepare any slides or presentation. And I feel like you told them a great lecture and now I'll be questioning them and it will be like good, good cop and bad cop right now. <laughs> but I'm wondering if there's any volunteers for the next stage. So I think it's good to, um, good to practice it when we talk about so we can demonstrate everything what we are actually talking about. So do we have any volunteers for the next section? Anyone? Ermak? Are you volunteering? You can unmute yourself if you're volunteering. So can you hear me? I cannot yes. unmute myself. Okay. Yep, yeah. yep, we can hear you. I think it was yeah, Okay. Um I can give it a try. Thank you so much for volunteering. It's a tough thing to do right now. So what kind of station that? Um... So I was thinking, as that Jakob mentioned, um, some portfolio questions. I can do one portfolio question and perhaps Alian, if Jakob has time, they can we can all give you some feedbacks. And then um, we can do clinical station as well. As um, I mean, I think that would be a nice thing to do. Would that sure. be all right, Jakob? Are you there? I think Jakub had a case that he needs to attend. He's on oh. call right now. Sorry. Okay. Um, no, sorry. And we can, yeah, we, we can, can, we can maybe do you... like clinical questions directly if that's okay for you. Um, I think Jakub will not be joining again. Oh, that's all right. Though. I can. I, I wanted to feel like as TSTs are also coming closer, I thought I could ask these all blended in yeah. as if yeah. like it's a real yeah. interview. So, um, and I'll try to keep it like as real as possible. So I'll try to keep it like as poker faced. All right. Um, so Irma, thank you for joining us today. This is your interview and you have X amount of time. So can you tell me what do you know about clinical governance and should everyone be involved? So um, clinical governance um, represents the um, theme that a trust and the departments follow to ensure that um, they are following the best practice and they are providing the best care for the patients and um, they are safe. Um, clinical governance has seven different pillars, uh, which would involve um, clinical effectiveness, audit, uh, risk management, um, information, um, staff management, um, patient experience, training and teaching. So um, all of the departments and the trusts are responsible for each um, seven pillars. They would they will ensure clinical effectiveness by um, keeping up with the evidence based practice, um, auditing their clinical practices, um, managing the risks by um, with incident control, um, incident reporting and more about mortality and morbidity meetings um, and clinical clinical governance meetings that are done uh, regularly um, and training and teaching provided for the staff and the trainees. Can you tell me more about your, how did you get involved in clinical governance? Can you give me some examples? Um, 
So I, I had a chance to um, do an audit in the department um, and present it in a um, departmental meeting, which involved, um, which involved um, reviewing the operation notes done in the department and uh, checking their compliance with the Royal College of Surgeons uh, good clinical practice. Um, I had the chance to do this audit at the time the patient, the, the hospital was changing their hospital information system. Um, so, and I decided to do this audit because there was a missed um, DVT prophylaxis and DVT development in one patient, which was missing in the post-op instructions. So I, I had a meeting with the consultants in the department and asked their ideas and decided to put some reminders on the up notes as smart phrases. And then I reassessed the data, collected the data, and um, demonstrated the change uh, that the, the compliance of these operation notes with the RCS guidelines, closing the second loop and presented the results in the meeting and collected further feedback to develop the smart phrases further. Um, can you tell us why should we uh, hire you as a core surgical trainee? Um, Okay, so I believe um, my background and um, as, as a fellow in surgical departments, um, also having experience in the NHS is a, um, is a good start. And I have, um, I, 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 I am known to be a reliable and hardworking team, team member, which, uh, which I would be, would, that I would be able to provide uh, support for my team look out for my colleagues and um, help my seniors as best as I can. I, I have a keen interest in research. I would like to keep, um, keep and um, develop these skills further to, um, to contribute to the evidence-based medicine. Okay, thank you. I think for this, for this practice purpose, I'm, just, I'm going to stop because I asked you a few questions. How do you think it went? <laughs> okay. Sorry, I got a bit excited. Uh, in That's normal. How do you think it went? Um, I think I was not prepared some, for some of the questions well, so I just uh, managed to find my weaknesses going through with you. Um, I lack structure, especially when I haven't practiced uh, a question like this before. I understood mm -hmm. the importance of practice. So I think you are overall good, but I think you can do better because you know what you're talking about. You just need to like, Jakub was talking all about it. So you need to polish it. And even if something that you haven't been prepared yet or you don't know the answer, you can still use those structures and make it up in a way. So clinical governance can come up um, in the interviews in some form. So you need to know those. But the thing is like in FRCSs, for instance, they say like if there are seven pillars, they say, don't say seven pillars, because if you can't remember that one of those pillars, then they will be like, oh, what's the seventh one then? Like they might try to catch you from that. So you can say like there are, I liked your definition because I think it didn't come across as like too rehearsed. So you use your own words to describe and that was good enough for me. Um, you mentioned all seven pillars. That was impressive, to be fair, because I think it's difficult to remember them. And do you, you need to listen to the questions very carefully, though, because I asked, do you think should everyone get involved? And the answer I was expecting mm -hmm. something was more like either it's a bit a yes or no question. And yes, everyone should kind of get involved. And they're already getting involved because, as you mentioned, all these seven pillars are actually in our daily lives. So um, I, I kind of expected you to, you know, end in that way, but you didn't, but you could have mentioned it in a better way. And then I wanted to get it out from you. So that's why I asked, okay, what is your involvement then? Because I'm sure you've done teaching sessions. I'm sure you've done your CBD workplace assessments, you know, audits, all those research bits and so on. So all this is you do within the NHS is actually a part of clinical government. So you can, you could say something like, uh, I've been actively involved in clinical governance processes as I've been actively participating in teaching sessions. I've been doing audits and research and yet the other. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And then you, you yourself picked an audit 
And that's why I was like, OK, tell, tell us about the audit bit. The questions around it could be what is an audit or re what's the difference between research and audit? And for the for the whole group right now, I'm trying to make it closer to the training sessions because the thing is, um, when you do a non-training interview, you don't know what kind of consultant body you're going to have in your panel. And they will want the best candidate as possible, right? And they might have someone in mind as well. So you're kind of racing against all the other people. So you need to be at your best possible version of yourself. And you need to be, and if you if you have no NHS experience, this is all be like French to you, you know what I mean? So that's why I'm trying to make this in a, in a, in this format. So you can know like what they kind of expect from probably a, as a standard. Um, when you explain your audit, I like the fact that you mentioned that you presented it and you completed your loop, but I think you can just kind of make your, but what was your audit a little bit more precise in a shorter way? Like, did you check DVT assessment and change the op, op templates and just make it like, you know, one or two sentences and don't waste time, mm -hmm. I think. And the next question was, um, what was the next question? I used camp structure for that one. I said, yeah. why should we pick you? And someone was asking, um, we are applying for different jobs, but we have only one CV and like, how are we going to make it? You know, like, how are we going to answer all these specialties? So I think um, at the end of the day, everyone wants a safe doctor, whether it's a training or non-training job. Everyone wants an enthusiastic person. Everyone wants a reliable person. So. Um, I think Jakob mentioned the camp structure. K is that C is for clinical, A is for academic, M and P personal, M, M is management basically. So this isn't. So why should we pick you? Why do you think is this job for you? What let's say you're specifically going for a specialty? Um, why orthopedics? Why general surgery? Why A and E? Why CSD? So all this is about what you why should they pick you it's all about camp structure and if you even if you're going for a gynae job a &E job doesn't matter what you're doing you should have some common personal traits anyway so you can actually shape your answers around that so uh, i'm not sure about the application process like when you do non-training job applications for each jobs you need to shape it a bit around it but if you get an interview then you really need to use this one and um, you, you, did you think that you use that camp structure when you think of uh, it? I, I actually aim to use it, but I just mess up you with the order. So um, I picked personality second than clinical. I didn't reflect well on each um, section, so yeah, I could improve so, a lot. So my answer to this would be, as I'm an orthopedic person, and so for clinical bit, what you really can say is like, as an as an as a as I wanted to do orthopedic surgery, I've done my relevant surgical rotations as well as I was a major trauma fellow in Edinburgh, and now I'm working as an re, uh, orthopedic registrar in St George's. I've done I completed my basic surgical courses, and I've been blah 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 blah. So clinical is usually like what you've done. So if I'm if because I'm going for more senior stuff, I can also say like, oh my oper my e log book is about like this 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 many percentage of operations. So if you're going for CSD or like you know for any let's say any job basically, you can make it like clinically because I was interested in XYZ department, you know, that specialty. I've done this relevant specialty rotations when I was on F1 or F2, or you can say like, you can say like, I've done my elective rotation in this specialty and I made sure that I completed such and such courses to make sure that I'm a good clinician. So because that is the clinical part, right? And then you have academic bit. Academic bit will involve your publications, your audits, like your presentations, your um, meetings that you kind of attended. So you can mention like, I don't know, I've done X amount of, you know, I have X amount of publications if you have any. And then I have done X amount of audits and I presented them locally, this, this amount of them locally and that amount of them nationally done. You have the academic bit as well. The thing is, every time you talk about this, you, you, you have the option. You can either mention about these things a little bit 
and you can actually reflect upon it. If you reflect on your answers, then you are you you will get a you know that bonus points as well. So if you instead of just saying like I have X amount of uh, research papers, you can say that I have this amount of papers, and I've learned from that the time management is very important. When I when I was studying, you know, medicine and I was doing my foundation years uh, jobs and I'll keep this in mind. When, and when I become a core surgical training or when I, you know, when I start working for your department, I'll make sure that my team is continuing to work on research without burning out. Bam, you have a better answer. Does that make sense? So if you can reflect upon those stuff or let's say clinically, you've done this, this, this course. And you can also mention a higher level, of course. So if you haven't done ATLS, uh, because it's usually core surgical training level, of course, not foundation, you can say that I've, I've done my ALS course and I'm looking forward to do the ATLS because I want to make sure that I'm progressing in my career. That, that, that will show that you are thinking ahead, you're planning your career in the future. So management would be your leadership skills and uh, personal is like, um, basically like if you have any like some people say like oh my family got injured and that's why I'm choosing orthopedics I was so inspired by an orthopedic surgeon this is just an example um, you said something like I have my teams back and so on so whenever you say something you have to make sure that you're supporting it with an answer like with an example and after that you need to you need to kind of reflect 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 in all of your answers is as much as you can does that make sense? Ermak, I don't know. Are you there? Yes, I, I just I, I muted myself because some ambulance was passing. Um, so um, I I will practice on this structure. I think it was very helpful. Jump is a good structure. I mean, all those structures are important in these portfolio and like commitment to specialty questions. Um, I um, ask you a question. Of course, of course. So before jumping into answering a question that we are not very prepared for, especially like how long the silence is okay. Like I, I, I usually intend to jump in. But I think I should just take a bit of time to prepare. So if you, when you're asked a question, like doesn't you can take it. You know, you can pause. That's all right because five minutes, six minutes is actually longer than you think. So when you think of five seconds or 10 seconds in that five or six minutes is actually nothing when you think about it. Instead of, you know, having a verbal diarrhea without thinking, if, if you want to pause, that's all right. But it shouldn't become like 30 seconds of awkward silence, you know, like, or like it shouldn't become awkward. So you can say, you can even say like, Oh, give me a, can you please give me a second? I, I'll just gather my thoughts and then bam, you get you start like instead of having an awkward silence. But obviously what they will want to see, especially in training, because it's so competitive, they want to see people who are prepared. So it will be like so slick and bam, 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 bam. Okay, thank you. Um, um. We have uh, three volunteers in total and okay. 30 minutes. Uh, so, yeah, yeah minutes. how would you like okay. to? Yeah, how would you like to? Uh, OK, we can go for uh, can they the next person can unmute themselves and I can ask, do they prefer? We, we said we're going to do clinical stations, right? So we should do clinical, I guess. Uh, Hussein, you can unmute yourself if you are here still. Um, who's, okay, who's let's, let's, who's, who's, who's saying um, you can uh, unmute yourself and if you're not able to I'll, I'll go to the next volunteer but yeah just um, um, hello yep yep we can hear you I'm so so sorry about that How yeah, yeah that's fine that's no. <laughs> hi can, can uh, what's your name sorry I can't there are Hussein. Lots of Hussein hi Hussein. um hi. do you have any specialty interest or are you going for non-training jobs training jobs I'm basically applying for non-training jobs okay any specialty interest that you have um medicine basically but I have been applying all over so medicine or surgery either way would be good okay um 
let's see if I can ask you some more medical scenario than. Um... Oh, oh, by the way, could you ask me a surgical question? Because I do have an interview coming up for surgery. <laughs> is it general <laughs> surgery or what? It surgery? is general surgery. It's colorectal general surgery. OK, then let me find the scenario for you. Great, thanks. A second. Sorry, it's a where are you applying for? Where is where is this interview with? Sorry? Which, which hospital you are going to have interview with? Uh it's uh, Plymouth. I know a case for you, but I'm, I need to find it. Just give me a second. No worries. Hmm. OK, shall I turn? You don't need to be timed for a non-training job, so I'll just go ahead. Um, you are the general surgery SHO on call at night. You've been called by the nurses on the general surgical ward regarding a 68 year old patient who has been confused since late afternoon. She's been wandering around the corridors and refuses to return her to her bay. She gets very agitated when the nurses try to persuade her to go back to bed and the nurses want you to prescribe medications to calm the patient down. What would you do? Right. Um, first of all, I will, I will thank the nurses for telling me about the patient. I'll go and assess the patient myself, um, see what the, what the situation is, see if she's uh, widely stable. Obviously, if she's walking the corridors, there's no, no problems with her vitals, hopefully. And I'll try to persuade the patient to uh, and uh, reason with her if I if I'm able to and I'll uh, also inform my seniors uh, about that the patient is wandering and there could be a hazard to her health if she falls down or something and uh, I'll try to get um, some help to actually persuade her to get back to her bed. Is that it? So she went back to bed, but she's getting up again. What are you going to do? Yeah. So uh, once she's back in bed, I'm going to, because all the patients usually, um, this happens because they might have uh, sepsis or a UTI infection that's very common in older patients. So I'll get a, a full blood workup and a urine culture and send some investigations and uh, obviously phone my registrar on call that the investigations have been sent and um, stabilize the patient. If she has uh, any problems with the BP or vitals, start on fluids um, and wait for the investigation to get back. So let's say you examine this lady and you find out that she's pyrexal at 38.5 Celsius degrees and yeah. she has heart rate of 130, 130, mm -hmm. blood pressure of 90 over 60, respiratory mm -hmm. rate is 22 breathe per minute. ECT shows fast AF and her yeah. known past medical in history includes hypertension, ischemic heart disease and type 2 diabetes. You also noted that she is actually someone who's five days post-op. So she, she had a low and so three... sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Uh, my, my network just disconnected. Could you yeah. just repeat the last sure. line, please? So you also noted that she is a day five post-op post -op patient. She had a right. low anterior resection from malignancy and her surgical wound has been pink fluid oozing from it. She is very right. tender on palpation of her abdomen. Nurses reported to you that she's been, not been eating and drinking much and has not been open her bowels yet. How are you going to manage this situation? Well, the patient is definitely deteriorating in health. I'm going to begin my assessment through the A to E approach and make sure that she's stable. Um, and um, she's definitely, I feel, going to sepsis because of infection. I will, I will do the sepsis protocol. Um, I will uh, give antibiotics and pericol. Um, I would uh, start her on oxygen and fluids, and I will send lactate and blood cultures and urine output. I'll measure those. Um, and um, yeah, I'm a, and I'll call for senior help as soon as uh, the basic panel is done. Um, yeah, that's, that want... would be my assessment. Do you want any specific quick tests, something specific that you can get quicker than the official bloods, maybe? Um, you mentioned she's five days post off for anterior resection. Mm -hmm. mm, um, I don't know. I would, uh, I would examine the patient. I would uh, try You're to... You're examining the patient, abdominal 
Yeah, I would uh, I would do an abdom abdominal exam. And I'll look at the wound and I'll see if I can clean the wound uh, first of all and, and see if there are any pathologies in the abdominal exam. Any findings? Yeah, you've already done that and your wound is oozing pink fluid mm -hmm. and abdomen is tender. I said um, you've assessed the patient as well and uh, yeah. I, you said you will send some basic panels. So which bloods you're going to take exactly? I'm going to do a full blood count. I'm going to uh, send for blood cultures and um, we'll also do UNEs and um, maybe LFTs. Is that it? Are you going to take that only? Anything else? Um, that's all I can think of at the moment, sorry. Mm. And, the, and then the sepsis protocol will obviously go, right? Lactid, higher lactid levels. Uh, okay, right. so gotcha. you said sepsis protocol and lactate. So yeah. for lactate, that means you're going to take a gas, right? Um, yeah, yeah. You actually done an ABG, not even better. Your pH is, you can write them down if you like. Your pH is 7.29. Yeah. PaO2 is 11.7, your carbon dioxide is 3.9, bicarb yeah. is 10, base excess is minus 4, lactate is 7. And you're lucky because your hospital lab is so quick, you even have the blood results. Your HP is 120, white cell is 18, platelets are 17, 700, neutrophils 8.5, sodium is 143, 143 potassium is 4.2, your urea is, the patient's urea is 17 and the baseline is 6. Creatinine is 190, her baseline is 70. Her CRP is 186. Do you want me to repeat anything? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. That's what I said to write it down. Yeah, please. I have been writing it down, um, but um, I got as far as uh, bicarb and like lactate is 7. So lactate is 7. Right. Yeah, so you got yeah. the black gas, right? She has pH yeah. of 7.29. 29, yeah. 7, yeah. By, uh, bicarb is 10, oxygen bicarb is 10. 11, CO2 yeah. is 3.9, yeah. base excess is minus 4. And as for the official bloods, HB is 120. Yeah. White cell is 18. 18, yeah. Platelet is 700. Platelet is 700, okay. Yes, neutrophil is 8.5. Yeah. Sodium, okay. is, sodium is 143. Sodium 143, got it. Potassium is 4.2. Mm -hmm. Urea is 17, baseline is 6. Yeah. Creatinine is 190, baseline is 70. Yep, got it. CRP is 186. Okay. okay. So, looking at this profile, what do you think the results are showing to you? Okay, just give me a second, please. This patient yeah, is definitely... Definitely acidotic, right? So she has a low, low, low uh, CO2. She could be uh, metabolic acidosis, right? Because um, bicarb is low. Um, uh, she could be a metabolic ac uh, acidosis. She has low hemoglobin and she has raised WBC and neutrophil. So she's definitely in sepsis because she's undergoing uh, there's a lot of inflammation. So her CRP is 186. Um, so we, she's definitely, in my opinion, uh, she has an infection and going to sepsis. She's going to septic shock. Um, well, I don't have the, B, the blood pressure, so I can't be very certain. Um, but uh, your blood pressure was 90 over 60. 90 over 60. So she's just at the border, right? So I would prepare for a septic shock. And uh, yeah, and I would start her on antibiotics and fluids and oxygen. Is there anything else that you're going to do for this lady? Um, I would definitely call for senior help. That's what I'll do. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> your senior is, you're lucky. Your senior is like, oh, okay, can you get a CT scan for me, for mm -hmm. this patient? And you got the CT scan, miraculously again. And mm -hmm. her CT scan showed intra-abdominal collection. And you informed your registrar regarding this. Um, however, she's currently scrubbed in theatre for another emergency case and is unable yeah. to review the patient, but asks you to consent the patient for emergency laparotomy and yeah. discuss with HDU for a uh, bed postoperatively. You're not right. trained to take consent yet. And the hospital yeah. policy is for at least a registrar review for any patient to be referred to HDU and ICU. So what would you do? 
if the registrar is the only person who's allowed to do it, I would explain the procedure to the patient if she has capacity, right? So I would explain the entire procedure, like what she's supposed to be going down, make the arrangements, but I would still wait for the registrar to get the actual consent if that is the policy. But I'll make sure that everything is ready and the patient is well aware of what is about to happen. What kind of arrangements you're going to make? I'm going to book uh, the OT. I'm going to prep the patient for surgery, making sure she's nil by, nil, nil by mouth. Um, I'm going to make sure all the pre, uh, pre-operative checklist is done, the, such as basic panels of blood tests. I'm going to consent, uh, well, I can't consent the patient, but I'll make sure that she's aware. And, uh, and I'll book the HDU bed, as asked, and uh, I'll just wait for the registrar to get down there and make sure she's stable. So you, let's say I'm the patient, you come to me, how are you going to tell me? Well, if you have capacity and you need, and I'll tell you that, uh, well, we got your CD scan results back and there's something that's, there's, there's something inside the abdomen that shouldn't be there and we need to. And I'll be like, Elvis, Elvis, help me. I have a well, meeting with Jesus. What are you going to do now? Then you definitely don't have capacity to consent. And then we'll try to get next of kin. Yeah. Um, and see if that's possible. But you kind of already knew it, right? Because she was already in sepsis and she was already a bit like going off. So yeah, that's, that's, well, that's why well done. You, that's... you can read now. The station <laughs> okay, thanks. The... That, that's why I raised my hands to get this uh, the jittery pun out of myself for the interview. Sorry. <laughs> so how do you think it went? Uh, pretty bad. <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> it's, this is the first time you're doing, and it's, your your interest is not even surgery, but surgery is actually quite medical, isn't it? People get yeah, surprised. It is. <laughs> yeah. So, anyone who wants to give a little feedback, with, like how do you think um, he did, or like you can also, you know, give yourself a feedback a little bit, show show us your inside, and I'll give you my feedback as well because I think that shows awareness. Is there anyone who would add on? to his answers like anything else that you guys would add on what did you like the most or what did you would do something like is there anything that you would do differently anyone um Andre when Manikandan uh, raised their hands I'll I'll give Andre a chance to unmute her himself Andre you can unmute yourself if that's okay hello can you hear me yes yes, yes we can, can yes you. Okay, um, he, uh, for Hussein, he did very well, but I have like a few steps to be organized if I may tell you about it. So for this kind of patient, we got in the MRCS exam. So this, what should be, we activate the CRISP protocol. We'll go to the ABCD approach. And then uh, after we have done what I've said about the airway and breathing and circulation and getting to do the D for uh, the AVBU score, is the alert or not, so if the patients are or not, and then to go to exposure and take some samples to check the both limbs for uh, DVT or so on. And then after we're done with the CRISP assessment, we'll go to the uh, uh, secondary assessment and uh, liaise with the IT registrar to check the patients for if you're gonna need an uh, uh, gonna need an ITU post-operative. I, as I thought, it's um, most probably uh, leakage from the the resection post-operative. Uh, as well, I will do what I have done that escalate to my senior. Um, I will uh, actually. Um, uh, ask for uh, for help, and um, for sure I will organize the the OR theater. Uh, for sure I go for consent, and I have I will do everything. But just the one thing I want to do is to um, uh, like I would tell the examiner or I will tell the interviewer that I will activate the CRISP protocol, and I will go to the sepsis six protocol or sepsis three bundle. Um, I think they like to hear the, the these terms. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. They like hearing like protocols or if there's any special name to those. Like, and don't mention sepsis three, sepsis just say sepsis six. Yeah. And um, did you say you've done MRCSs? Yeah. So yeah, for MRCS people, um, CRISP and ATLS should be like bam, bam, bam. But if it's someone who's not done these it's okay to not to be familiar with CRISP basically but again if you're going for a surgical job 
um, I think it's quite reasonable to look at CRISP protocol. Basically, ATLS, ALS, CRISP, they're all A to E, and it's just a thorough systematical review of the patient. Um, I think it was okay. Um, this is our first time. There were a few things that you kind of, you could make a little different. Um, mm -hmm. One of them was like, definitely like CRISP and sepsis 6 is definitely good input. So let's start from the beginning. So you said, okay, there's a patient who's wandering around in the ward somewhere, or this could be just a &E setting as well, an acutely confused elderly. So you said, I, I liked the initial approach. You were like, okay, I'll check, make sure that she's stable. I'll check the vitals. You're going to try to build a rapport with the patient and try to get her back to bed. But I gave you the scenario, right? Like she's a general surgery patient who's been confused for a while. We know that she's already confused and she's getting agitated. And um, like, are you just going to put her back in, tuck her in and then leave the ward? Like you're not going to do it in reality, right? And you're not going to ring your mm -hmm. registrar right away either. Like, because mm -hmm. the registrar would be like, oh, what's going on? Like, you know, do you know if this is her baseline or is she just, you know, because you don't know if this is her baseline, but then we, the scenario says that she's very agitated, right? So like I told, uh, I told Ermak, listen the questions very well. So we know that she's off her baseline, so you can't leave that patient in the bed and leave or like just give her some Zopiclone and leave. So this is a general surgery patient. First, you not, you've got to know what, um, What's what? Why is she in the hospital? Or get more information about the patient. You'll check the patient's notes, medical notes, recent blood test. If she's had any operation, you can check with the nurses if this is her baseline. Or if you mention these things, you'll get like, okay, this person actually has dealt with these problems in in real life. So it's not just like you're talking out of just because you memorize some script or something in reality that's what you will do this patient is it is it always dementic or because it's an elderly patient can have dementia or is there something wrong with her like what's going on and then like when you see like and then we're leading you this like the scenario leads and then you you will examine the patient you mentioned the vitals but and uh, because you said the vitals i was happy to give you but you're going to examine the patient and is, this is a general surgery patient, and then we are going to reveal you the background because you are looking at the medical notes that she's post-op day five. Um, you need to, so you got the, the, as the next question, now we have the temperature, heart rate of 130, blood pressure is 9 to 60, and respiratory rate is 22. She's an AF, she has all these medical problems. And she's a, um, an abdominal surgery of post-op day five. So for a junior, it should be like, this is an acute abdomen until proven otherwise. So you need to, like, you can mention crisp here or there, it doesn't matter. But here you really need to rule out because this is quite important. So from the moment you think that this is an acute abdomen, could be a wound related, or if there's anastomosis, it could be anastomosis leak as well. So you've got to think that, okay, I need to keep this patient in the mount because if this is an acute abdomen, she will be for theater. If you say these things early, you'll get, you'll, you'll win. Um, so again, normally in these interviews, even if you know what ATE is, they usually, especially in the junior levels, um, not for, like for seniors, they assume that you already know what ATE is, but it's good practice to say like airway, breathing, circulation, you know, disability and exposure. If you're doing ATLS, you need to say airway and triple uh, immobilization of spine. For some reason, they just like to hear the whole thing, like breathing and ventilations, circulation and hemorrhage control, disability and drugs, e exposure and everything else. So depends on the scenario. You should say it out like openly, I think. Um, once you mention these things, you, you should always, in, in a surgical scenario, if there's any wound, you have to mention specifically that you're going to check the abdomen or it doesn't matter where the wound is, you're going to check the wound because you need to see if the wound is leaking or not. I already told you that this wound is leaking. What you've done then did was, um, we are talking, you said ATE, and then I specifically tried to prompt it to you to get the gas out and all like what relevant bloods you're going to send. So you said FBC cultures using these LFTs. Um, I mean, yeah, you sent, okay, sent LFTs, but you didn't send CRP, you didn't send, you didn't mention the gas. And gas is the like one of the most important things, right? It's because it's a part of your sepsis, 
is you need to see lactate. If this is an acute abdomen, then the patient will have higher lactate. Am I going too fast, by the way? I don't know. Uh, no, it's just me talking. So if I'm going too fast. No, this is perfect. Yeah. And then we talked about the... Um, you should also, by the way, whenever you guys mention CRISP protocol, you, like especially if you're going for training interviews and let's say you're talking about C circulation, you've got to say, I'm going to make sure that this patient is in my mouth, has two large core cannulas, and I would withdraw, withdraw blood for FPCs, UNE, CRPs, blood cultures, gas for lactate, and yada yeah, yada. And when you assess breathing, you'll get chest X-ray, and I'll ask the nurse to do an ECG. So all these, you know, there there is a um, like protocol that is there, and you need to be so uh, so slick about it. You need to be able to get it out like in forty five seconds or something. Like you'll just need to keep saying it to yourself like a crazy person until you get that interview. Um, so if you told those stuff during that A to E bit, then the next thing would be like, oh yeah. He already mentioned the gas, so I'll give him the gas and blood results. And the next thing will be like, here is your blood results. You mentioned astosis, and then you said metabolic, right? Like, don't ask me, you know, you, you are getting questioned here. <laughs> be confident that is a metabolic acidosis, we know that. And you, also, there's also an element of AKI kept dub, like a double, like there's baseline of 670 of, you know, creating in urea's increase. So you need to also say that, this patient is having AKI means like she's critically unwell and some who's someone at risk of multi-organ failure. Does it make sense? So when I say like what does what do this yes. result show, you need to be able to make comments on these stuff. I like the fact that you inform your seniors like at every step. It's just I felt like there is a there is a fine balance, and I agree that's quite a tricky one because if you involve them too early, like without assessing the patient, it would be like as if you don't know what you're doing. But obviously, at right stage, you need to more than you need to be safe. So I think rather than not informing your seniors, if you have someone who's informing your seniors early, it's still better than not telling them at all. Does that make sense? But again, I felt like you just said you just informed it. You just informed the senior a little bit early because you haven't actually assessed the patient. So assess right. the patient and then say that I would make sure that my senior registrar is aware of this patient. You can say um, that that would come across as a bit confident as well. Uh, uh, um, yeah, um, really sorry to disturb. Um, the, the, there are a couple of people asking if you can just maybe like a bit slowly mention the. It's about blood orders. I think especially if you can start from uh, the part that you mentioned, I will make sure a patient has two large board cannulas and I will draw bloods for blah, blah, and then do a couple of other things. Um, if you can just maybe like do that um, at the end or maybe now. Uh, yeah, just I like mean, we just had one last question left, basically, and that's the non-clinical question of the station. Basically, that's actually, again, checking if you're a safe doctor or not, because are you someone who's like, you know, uh, impulsive that who's going to be who's going to try to be a hero and try to consent the patient by himself or is he a safe doctor who knows his own limitations and he has insight so you did the right thing by not consenting the patient but what you could say like this patient's already confused from the beginning so you could just say okay i'm aware that this patient is going to be for consent form four because it's a patient with no capacity, so we are going to make the consent form four. What you can do to save your registrar's time, you could still call the next of kin or try to reach them, tell them that their loved one is getting unwell and might require another surgery, blah, blah, blah. Update the next of kin. Because in consent form four, there is an area that we put next of kin's details that whoever is aware of the situation. So that's that consent bed. Meanwhile, you can always make sure that patient is ready by making sure that she has two group and saves done for her. We already done the bloods anyways, right? Like her culture and so on. So the only thing you can add on here, if you haven't already done it, to make sure that she has two valid group and saves, make sure that patient is booked for CPOT, make sure that she's getting the anesthetist, like 
to the world, like an aesthetic review. Make sure that theater matron know. And Talia Registrar, is our consultant aware of this situation? Do you want me to let the consultant know? Because your registrar is, is you don't know if the pay, if your registrar is senior enough to do, you know, laboratory by themselves alone. So those bits would be like all like, you know, cherry at the top. Does it make sense? Thank you. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, as it comes to the questions, um, so in CRISPS and ATLS, there is so we, we don't just say A to E, there is a breakdown. Um, Ermak, are you still there? Is there anyone who's going for a CSD soon? No, I'm just applying for ST311 for non training. Would you like to try for the like CRISP or ATLS, A to E, you know, that quick um, and then yeah. we can. Yeah, yeah you want to right. go and then we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just just applying from Egypt. I've never uh, I don't have any NHS experience. That's so fine. The, so that's why I, I may lack some uh, ordinary stuff or the yeah, you know how it works in the UK. So I just okay. know it from reading. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, what would you like me to to, to um, set up? That A to E. Um, they, I think they ask like. Uh, yeah, protocol. Yeah, yeah, Chris protocol or oh. ATLS or a, they're all yeah. same. So A to E is actually the same. In ATLS, you just have yeah. additional bits to A and E. So yeah. I think this is for all levels because this is for. To be fair, if you're going for ST3 jobs, they probably assume that you already know these A to E bits, but this is for mostly the other SHO level jobs because they will expect SHO, they will need to check if the SHOs know the details or they're just saying like A to E and making it up. So okay. if you can yeah. tell them in detail in a quick way, yeah, um, and then we can talk about it. So um, there are two things. One, the ATLS, which is the, for the trauma and the CRISP for the critically uh, ill patient for the, the CRISP protocol. So we go through the CRISP protocol. Once you see the patient is critically, uh, critically unwell, a surgical patient. So you activate the CRISP protocol. That will you need help. You will need help from uh, an assistant, and you need help from a nurse. So the first thing you to go is to be quick. The first one is to put the patient over a high flow oxygen uh, and then you secure the airway. Uh, you check that the patient is talking so you know that the airway is secured. You go for the breathing, you check the ex uh, chest expansion, trachea in place or shifted. You, uh, you check the chest uh, movement, uh, you check of any flail chest or and so on. And then you go uh, to uh, listen for the compartment of the chest with your stethoscope. And then you go for the circulation. You check the blood pressure from both sides. You check the, uh, you palpate the, the, the pulse and you get the blood pressure and you check the capillary filling time. And uh, by this time, you, you, you put on two white board canines and pour some blood and send for tests. That would be, in this case, would be the CBC or uh, full blood count the liver function tests or the and the kidney function test in ABG it's so crucial and important and you send for lactates uh, and some blood cultures if you you, uh, you suspect a sepsis or infection uh, and uh, if the patient is hypotension so I will put the patient over 15 milligrams of uh, isotonic solution um, if the patient is normal tensive you put on the over 10 is a uh, is norm uh, is hypertensive you put over five uh, and then uh, you, you're done with the C you go to the D so you you you, uh, you stick to the AVBU quick score which is a, a, a if the patient is alert it's A or a patient is uh, uh, um, um, responsive to pain it's P and, uh, yeah, and you uh, is unconscious a F B U, yeah, a verbal and pain in unconscious. A V uh, A F B U, okay. So this is the output score. It's uh, he's completely alert. He is uh, alert to verbal. He's alert to pain. He is unconscious. This is the the quick score. You check the patient is conscious or not conscious. 
And then you go to the E, which uh, keeping in mind to examine all the areas of concern, you check, you, you do an abdominal examination, you check the wounds, you take off the dressing, you check the drains, you check the, what is leak, uh, whether it's leaking or not leaking, you check the, the color of the leakage uh, fluid or leakage solution, you check his, uh, both limbs for uh, DVT, so you check his uh, cuff muscles. Um, and this is the formal uh, CRISP protocol. And then you check for the, uh, you, you obviously you're gonna uh, ask for help if the, uh, if the patient uh, condition is not unstable, so he might be admitted to uh, ITU or the high dependency unit. Uh, you will liaise with your consultant or your senior registrar in, uh, on call. Uh, you will ask for it and so on. The, the, the management managerial stuff you, you you mentioned already, but this is for the CRISP protocol as a quick one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it just like I said, it will come like probably when in 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 non-training interviews they might stop you or they might say like okay you have the blood results and this and that and they might like they might not make you complete the whole thing because it's it's a long by its, its own course. structure um but no i think it was good you you mentioned all it in very good detail um i think it was dr sarah who was asking for er scenarios is she online um i don't know um if she's willing like if she's willing to do that she can also try with the atls protocol which is a tiny bit different um, than it we, we we actually have an earlier hand from manikandan if that's okay um but did the person know the ATLS protocol? If not, I can say it. Sure. Uh, let's let's have a look. Um, yeah, uh, Marikan, then you can unmute yourself. Um, um, we can't really hear you. Yeah, thanks for letting me speak, actually. So, yeah. Um, what has been uh, discussed so far earlier? Uh, yeah, I'm following it. So apart from uh, what's been discussed so far, I would like to add, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the metabolic acidosis, the correction of metabolic acidosis, uh, he needs to say this, as well as uh, that is an associated acute kidney injury as well, which is given a function is above the waistline level. So I would like to have a look on that as well, and I would like to discuss this matter with the, yeah, obviously, the renal registrars. Yeah. So these are the points that he missed, I think. So, so I would like to add this as well. Mm -hmm. So for yeah. metabolic acidosis, uh, yeah, obviously he might uh, need to be transferred to ITU and have a uh, chat with the uh, intensive care physicians. And then uh, for metabolic acidosis, uh, on the advice of consultant or registrar, we might need to start him up because the respiratory rate is quite high and there is a CO2 washout as well. And uh, so probably he, uh, she might need an uh, non invasive ventilation as well as a bi the bicarb is also in low level. So she might, uh, she might need a bicarb infusion as well. And uh, for uh, acute kidney injury, obviously, um, we, uh, I would like to have a look at uh, the input output chart because uh, she is on uh, post operative day five. So I would like to uh, uh, calculate the output. If it is less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour, then obviously. Uh, it is an oliguria, oliguric AKI, and I will be more concerned. So these are all uh, very uh, life-threatening one, and uh, it needs to be um, attended uh, as soon as possible, rather than uh, you know, uh, taking her to the uh, operation theater. Mm. Yeah, I just want to add this. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. No. no, they're all valid points. Um, if you want, I can... I, I, um, Ali, how much time do we have actually? Do you think shall um, we, we don't we don't have much time actually? It's already um six thirty. Um okay. maybe we okay. can go through a couple of questions or yeah, I mean Yeah, sure. I think if they still want me to go through AT, I can go through that. But if they have other questions, I'm happy to go through that as well because um our, i can't remember the yeah. name sorry but egyptian colleague that's uh he's told about it quite nicely in in a detailed way so i'm happy with that but if they want me to repeat one more time i'm happy as well um and so let's we yeah. can if, look at the yeah, if you like to well. do it like a yeah if you like to do it like a summary because i i answered lots of most of the questions 
uh, and maybe that would be like a nice summary to hear from you in terms of like um, A3 um, mm -hmm. as a closing. So I think regardless, it's ATE, um, so ATLS is like I said, some additional adjuncts to it, but CRISP, ALS, um, all of them are actually quite same and similar. A is airway, and if it, if you're if you're in an A and E scenario, if you're dealing with a trauma patient, then you need to mention airway and C spine, and the buzzword for that is airway securing and triple immobilization of the C spine with collars and tape. So when you actually mention triple immobilization, people get like they just memorize, and then they ask like, what is the triple immobilization, and they think of like, what is the triple immobilization? Basically, two blocks and tape covered. That's called triple immobilization. Some people might not know it. Um, so airway and C-spine for ATLS. If you're talking about uh, someone in the ward or someone a &E, medically or surgically unwell, you can talk about airway because someone without trauma, if you say C-spine, then you'll it will be funny. So it depends on the scenario. And what you do in A and C-spine is securing the airway and in, triply mobilizing the C-spine. Then your next is breathing and ventilation. So breathing means you're going to put 15 liters cyphalo oxygen by a non-rebreathable mask, and you're going to titrate the patient's oxygen saturation to whatever is like patients need. So that's those are the buzzwords. So 15 liters high flow oxygen by a non-rebreathable mask, and then you're going to adjust it to patient's oxygen saturation. Um, then you're going to, like, breathing, what do you do? You're going to auscultate, you're going to percuss, you're going to palpate the chest to see if there's any. So if it's not a trauma scenario, you, you, you if you say flail chest, they might think that, what is he talking about? Or why is she talking about flail chest? Because it's not a trauma case. But you should think about, like, you know, are you, are you hearing a wheeze? Or, like, if it's a, you know, unwell patient, you, if, if you're in crackles. So it depends on the scenario, really. I try to, you know, cover all bases right now. But if you're in a trauma scenario, then you need to think about rib, possible rib fractures, flail chest, pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, surgical emphysema or trachea being central. Those would be the main thing for trauma cases. But apart from trauma cases, you, you, you still need to make sure that both lungs are having good air entry to both sides. So that's why you need to mention it. At this stage, if you don't say, I'm going to check the saturation and respiratory rate, I'll ask the nurses to tell me. They probably wouldn't tell you because they like don't assume that they, they will not assume that you already know it. So that's why you need to say that in breathing. You need to say respiratory rate and saturation and ask if the patient is maintaining the airway like and the saturation. And then your next stage will be C circulation and for trauma cases is hemorrhage control. So in circulation, you're going to ask about blood pressure and heart rate, capillary refill time. You're going to make sure that the patient has two large bore cannulas in the antecubital fossa. As you put the cannula in, you're going to withdraw blood for gas to see lactate, FBCs, eugenies, LFTs, bone profile, CRP, gr culture, group and say, depends on the scenario, you're going to mention these things. If it's an acute abdomen like case, you can mention group and save, and like sepsis cases, you have to say blood culture as well. I will see the blood pressure and respiratory rate, and I will start resuscitating patient, this patient with fluid challenge. But if I'm worried about any major hemorrhage, then I will activate the massive transfusion protocol. If it's a trauma case, you're going to make sure that you're giving painkillers like IV paracetamol or some form of analgesia, and you're going to give this patient tranexamic unless it's contraindicated. Does it all make sense or am I too fast? Because I mentioned too many things, I can carry on. Um, okay, I'm carrying I think, yeah, you can, okay, you can carry think, on if that's yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah. And um, make sure that you're getting chest x ray, you're making sure that you're getting an ECG, telling the nurses to get you an ECG. And if you're in an AE resus trauma case, then you need to say, Someone who is competent to do should the bedside fast scan. That is an ultrasound scan to see if there is any quick, you know, bedside scan to see if there is any bleeding focus or any intra intra abdominal fluids anywhere. And as for ATLS, you check four uh, five areas for bleedings. 
chest up the pelvis, long bones and the floor. So floor is like to see if there is any blood on the floor, is the patient gushing out somewhere. So I can repeat that again, chest up the pelvis, long bones and floor. So those five areas can be the, can be a cause for a massive hemorrhage, basically. Um, if you do any, any, any intervention in theory, you should go back and reassess from A to E. But I'm just carrying on for the sake of webinar. So D is your disability and your drugs. So disability, you check for pupils, size and reaction. If they are both size bi bilaterally reactive to light, what's the size? Are they like dilated or like, you know, pinpoint? You check temperature, you check BM, blood sugar and GCS 15. Like you can just, LP is for usually pediatrics, but you can say GCS, like the, you can say alpha as well if someone is like, you know, not um, fit enough, but usually we use GCS. Um, and then it, drug history and history of intoxication, like is it an overdose, whatever, like, and so on. Any anticoagulation history. And then E, exposure and everything else. Basically, if it's a surgical patient, you'll check for the wounds. If it's an orthopedic patient, make sure that patient's fracture is not open or there is no compartment syndrome. If it's a doesn't matter what kind of if let's say vascular patient and groin stuff, then you make sure that there's no skid marks suggesting, you know, an aneurysm or like, you know, intra drug intravenous drug abuser kind of cases. So that's the um A to E assessment like and it's it might be a bit a lot to take in for someone who's hearing it for the first time without any visuals, but I hope it is a bit clearer now. Can I can I add something? Yeah. Yeah. When also you could mention that any trauma case you should uh, should be asked about how to transfer the patient. So we would use the log roll maneuver. That anyone should be transferred from uh, from the ambulance to the ward or the to the bed. It should be on the log roll maneuver. They ask about it that there is four four persons. One check the back and one check the to stabilize the neck and head, head and neck, and one for the back and one from the limbs, and one to take off the the board that they are getting the ambulance with. So that's actually so when someone comes to, they don't come to ward usually if they are in trauma cases, and I mean, they go sorry, to the from the yeah, ambulance to the, to the and &E. the, So the way they they are transferred is they are in a hard um hard surface board, yeah, with the name hard board. And it's more, it's usually more trauma, to, uh, trauma is more than like that, meant, like where many people and you shift the patient across and you do undo the head side and leg side. And then what happens is, like you said, you log roll the patient means there will be few, like there will be people sur surrounding the patient from both sides. Anesthetist usually holds the head and um, anesthetist gives the instructions. You don't really need the pet slide at that stage because you have the hard block. It's something that carries the patient. So you basically shift it across and then you undo the heads and legs. And then you log roll the patient, means head and neck stable by the anesthetist and the body is shifted around. If the, like, meanwhile, you try to take, if depends on the patient's cases, but you try to see the back and try to quickly assess the back as well. But if you couldn't assess the spine, you, you just like those patients will usually have CT trauma series anyways. But in interview purposes, you can mention log roll and disability, I think. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, everyone, um, for joining and contributing. I'm just uh, sharing sharing the link that we do um, every week. Um, it's like a one-to-one -one free CV review sessions because we don't want you to go and spend thousands and hundreds of on that. Um, but anyway, it's, um, it's been amazing. And it's the, the, the fact that it was in, interactive, I think I, I really liked it. I was always thinking about the cases I gone through. I mean, it's, it's just such a such an amazing way to conduct a session. Um, um, so, I saw someone asking any clinical scenarios for oncology. Make sure that you know about um, sepsis, neutropenic sepsis. 
and it, it like it, I think that's that's the first thing come to my mind. Make sure that you know. Basically, it's the same with sepsis, uh, sepsis six, and some trusts have their cancer specific patients um, protocol. So in A and E, they have a separate area, and they start like tazosin and like strong antibiotics, and like they don't mm-hmm. wait for blood; they give antibiotics right away. In my current hospital, for instance, which is different yeah. than my other hospital. So if you're going for oncology, make sure you know about neutropenic sepsis and some crisis that they might can get in. Like, I think there are a few yeah. stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. whenever you go so, for a job, I would say know the emergencies of that specialty and know that like whatever, like what are the ways that patient can get unwell in the ward as well. Yeah, and feed, feed crustum, you can mention about feed crustum um, in the neutropenic sepsis as well if you... It just as a brownie point. Um, uh, there is a there is a hand from Ahmed Tutku. I'm just gonna allow the mic. Yep, you can unmute yourself, Ahmed Tutku. Uh, maybe it was a um, it was a wrong hand. Um, cool. Yeah. Someone um, asking about ENT registrar job interview questions. I've done ENT. Um, so I think, let me think. Obviously, at the SHO level, it's more like epistaxis and foreign body removal kind of stuff. But for the registrar, I think, um, again, I would say more detailed um, management of epistaxis, post tonsillectomy bleeds. Uh, maybe some airway management, like with tracheostomy related stuff, could be. And because you are going for a registrar yeah. job, they might ask about your logbook, your operative experiences, and they might ask you like, what is your what is your weakness? Like, what are you lacking? Um, what do you need to do? Do you need to do research? Do you need to do more operating? Do you need to? Are you able to do clinic by yourself? Kind of questions can come up because they're that those are things that you do as a registrar. So more register stuff like, mm, but, post- but if you have post tonsillectomy bleed, you'll take the patient to, you need to manage the bleeding and then consider taking patient to theatres at some point for ligation and so on. So you need to know those stuff, I would say. And I think there is a question is about a bit general really. What if I really don't know what to answer during the interview regarding some scenario? Can I answer as I will seek help to my senior colleague? And I was just trying to answer one question, uh, just like state your point about not to call your senior very early. Try to do the bits that you can do initially and try to gather as much of the data you can so you, your registrar can act on it. But in terms of like, if you don't know anything about the scenario, what would you advise, Aja? So my advice would be definitely be safe and don't lie that like, because if you try to lie that if you talk funny about things that you don't know, uh, you might say very silly stuff and that would make you look ridiculous. So as long as you don't do that, I think that's good. Like you can say like, I'm sorry, I haven't managed this situation in clinical practice, but there are principles that you can follow. Like what I just said, like you can get gather information, you can seek information for your registrar. I would make sure that the patient is safe. There is something called CCOT in the hospitals. Basically, those are like ICU nurses. They come if someone is very, very unwell in the ward and they quickly review the patient with the IT team. So you can mention those stuff. Um, but again, I, I think whoever you assess, you got to gather information and do the basic examination, basic blood and gas, what like, like you might not know what's going on exactly. And you can say like, I'm not 100% sure, I can't point out exactly, but there are principles that I will follow, which is ATE protocol. I will get information, try to identify what is this main problem, which, you know, puts patient in stress gather information and I will relate to my register as soon as possible when it's safe. Or I will tell the nurses to call CECO. Like there are answers around. Yeah. Wonderful. Um I I I'm not I can't see any more 
questions. Um, and then I'm really, I mean, there is there is a question, I think there's a similar one as well. Any resources for neurosurgery interview prep? And there is one about another speciality. There was one about another speciality. Um, I mean, I don't know if you like to go into detail, but in okay. general, Oxford handbooks. I think I, I think you should know Carter Kreina for sure, and you like facet dislocations. Depend on what what level they are going for, really, because in facet dislocations and Carter Kreiner's there are, there is a progressive neurology, so that is the compression and stabilizes that uh, dislocations are very important, and there is something called GERFT. Um, so could they just renew the Carter Kreiner guidelines? So if someone is going for neurosurgery, I would make sure that I know the new versions of it. Uh, obviously, you need to assess like inter what is monocular, you know, doctrine. What is um, like, you know, how to manage increased intracranial pressure. Um, per at least know the difference between subdural and you know subarachnoid hemorrhage. Like you know those kind of basic CT head. Like know what kind of bleeding you are dealing with. I think that should be more than fine clinical wise and perhaps someone who is post-op that might get on well and she, the patient might be bleeding in the head again so you might need to repeat CT head quicker and then reassess the patient. Um, those are the general scenarios that comes to my mind for neurosurgery and you need to know SDHR, neurological examination and so on. Um, we are getting um couple more questions. The one is about rheumatology and one is about a special doctor in hematology, if you have any specifics. Um, have you um, done any medical interviews? No, I've done a couple. I'm okay. Sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm a surgical person. I don't know the uh, account um, last. <laughs> I, I've done a couple medical. I haven't done rheumatology or hematology uh, itself. Um, I mean, the general advice for everyone is just please look at the Oxford Handbook for um, Oxford Handbook for Medicine or Oxford Handbook for that special that you are going to interview for. And um, for the rheumatology, there are a couple of um, emergency scenarios, which I don't really, I mean, I, it's, 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 it's just, sorry, I'm sorry, I, I just, can you hear me? I, I just. Yeah, we can hear you. Ali? Oh, yeah, I think sorry, my connection. Oh, I can, I can, I can hear you now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, what, what I'm gonna suggest, what well, sorry, what I was going to suggest because of the time limit, if you can send an email here, I'm just gonna um I'm just typing the email right now. Sorry, I I just don't want to take people's time, but I at the same time, I'm I'm more than happy to give you the emergency scenarios for any special that you're going through for the interview. Yeah. Either if I go through that interview, either I I'll find someone who's gone through that interview and sent you the questions. But for the rheumatology and hematology, I can send a couple of them uh, straight away. And and for the F2 standalone, a um, couple of couple of people mentioned, and, and we're going to do a session for that, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, FI2 standalone is... Generally, I think more... there, there is a handbook, right, for F2 standalones or like foundation. Yeah, 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 yeah. There thing. is, yeah, they Oxford handbook like... for foundation training. <laughs> like they have handbook they for everything. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely, that. absolutely. Um, um, yeah, the vascular surgery, something... ophthalmology. Yes, same. Please send an email, and yeah, I'll do my best to find someone who has gone through that interview for you. Hey, can I ask I'm... something before I leave? Sorry for interruption. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So it's a quick one. Uh, do you think that uh, anyone applying from outside the UK for the first job in the NHS, uh, that they uh, need him to or need him or her to know uh, every single details about how it works in the NHS trusts, or they they allow you for some um, like some experience when you reach there? Because this would be a much um, like much, uh, sorry, um, um, much competitive uh, as you compete with someone with an NHS experience. So does it really matter if you if they you don't know all the full uh, insights, uh, the structure of the hospital and the structure of how it works in the UK? They need you to read about it before. Am I clear? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, would you like to answer, Ajay, or do you want me to take this one? I mean, I um, we all. I didn't have any experience before NHS. I didn't work in my home country. I, I just started working in the NHS. So whenever you start for a job, you'll have some shadowing period. Depends on your level of experience, and people will understand that. Ideally, they should understand that you don't have that experience. Um, I think as long as you are safe, it should be all right. And don't be. Obviously, I understand there are some like bad people who will who might think like, oh, she doesn't know anything, he doesn't know anything, blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, you need to be safe, and you shouldn't be shy to asking questions. That's why I think this kind of communities are good. You know, you can ask questions. Like we we always try to help our juniors when they especially when they first started. Um, but I myself um, started working in the UK straight from medical school without having any clinical experience. So, and I started in A and E three months before COVID. So, <laughs> I hope you will be fine. But don't worry, you'll have uh, some shadowing as well. No, I, I'm sorry, but I, what I meant is to uh, they judge you in the interview for this that you don't have any knowledge about the NHS. Like they consider this in the interview. I, I don't mean in the actual work when you get the job. I mean at the interview, they they put this into consideration that you should know every or most of the uh, crucial stuff in the hospital and how it works in the NHS before they uh, accept you or take you for the job. I would say you need to know the fundamental stuff. Like, you, it's not like you don't know anything. You know the patient confidentiality, right? You've done PLAP exams minimum or MRCSs, some forms of it. So you, it's not like you don't know anything about the NHS. As long as, again, you're safe, you're, you know, respectful, you're not like, you know, someone who's dangerous out there, um, it should be all right. For training applications, it's different. The competition is out there, but for non-training jobs, you shouldn't come across as someone who can who's not reliable. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and you, when Yakov said, like, you should know what trust you're going through. Every trust has values, right? Know your hospital a little bit because there are so many people going for that job as well. And they will be like, why? They can easily ask you, like, why do you want to work with us specifically? So you need to think about these questions, anyways. So it's not like you don't you should it's not like you don't know anything about the NHS. You just don't have the experience, but that's okay. Does it make sense? Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. No worries. Let's let's take one more one one last question from Seema, who is just putting uh hand and yeah, you can you can unmute yourself, Seema. Hello. Hello. Hi, Dr. Rally. I just want to ask that, uh, like someone, uh, like with an experience of uh, around, like you know, eighteen or nineteen years, and having a GMC registration, uh, like, uh, is it better to go for a non-clinical jobs, uh, like uh, non, uh, you can say the non-training jobs, or uh, what would you advise in that case? And also, like you know, to know about the case studies. Like, you know, uh, recently my daughter has appeared for the medicine interviews in UK and uh, she has, uh, you know, learned a lot about those uh, case case studies like, you know, Charlie Gaba case and all. So is it like important for a person appearing for a job interviews also to know about all these cases? Um. So yeah, maybe I can take this one. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, uh, yeah, you should know the, uh, again, I'm just going to restate the same thing I just said. Um, you should know the basics, uh, fundamentals, the, the the scenarios that you've gone through either in PLAP or membership exams. And managing an unwell patient doesn't matter if it is a medical patient or surgical patient. What the expectation is, as someone who is um finish the medical school someone who has done an internship year uh should know about managing a patient unwell patient in the basic form and uh, stabilize them to recognize an unwell patient mostly at first and then making the basic management so 
um, yeah, I would say um, making sure you have some good fundamentals uh, will be important. But the thing is, the good thing is you, the interview is not interview panel is not going to ask you like lots of scenarios from different specialities. You would know the speciality. You would know the hospital that you are going to interview with. So you can check that, check the emerging scenarios for that um, speciality. And in terms of your first question with someone with 18, 19 years of experience, I mean, you should probably go 